Calvary Chapel Concord. Good morning. Blessed to have you guys here. Let's take it this morning and just lift it before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just come to you, Lord, and we're thankful, so thankful and grateful, Lord, for just the love that you shed abroad in our hearts, the work of the cross, Lord, that brought us life, new life in you. And Lord, so many things that are innumerable, just your goodness and your grace and the love that you love us with, Lord, that while we were still sinners, Lord, you loved us, you died for us. And Lord, you gave us that new life. And so, Father, we ask, God, that you would just open our eyes, open our hearts, our minds to all the things that you have in store for us this evening, this morning. That, Lord, you would just take this time and, and Lord, just use it to draw us as we draw near to you, closer to you, Lord. And that you, Father, would just come and be the mainstay the main thing in our life, Lord. And so, Lord, bless our time of praise. Inhabit the praises of your people. And, Lord, bless our time of study. And bless our time of fellowship, koinonia. That, Lord, you might be honored and glorified. And that we might be built up in this most holy faith. We love you and we praise you, Lord. And we just give these things into your hands. In Jesus' most precious name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.
Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. And let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King
his hands and multiply. God, all that I am and find my heart on the altar again. Set me on fire, set me on fire. Take all I have in his hands and multiply. God, all that I am and find my heart on altar again, set me on fire, set me on fire, here I am, God, arms wide open, pouring out my life, gracefully broken, my heart stands for me, you won't forsake me, you will be with me, here I am, God, arms wide open, pouring out my blood, gracefully broken, all to Jesus now. All to Jesus now, holding nothing back, holding nothing back. I surrender, I surrender.
God, we bow at your feet this morning, Lord, in praise and worship to your greatness, God. You have made us heirs along with the Son. You've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Father God, what more could we ask? Help us, Lord God, to walk in your ways, Lord, glorifying you, lifting you up, Father, we pray you forgive us of all of our sins and that you would have mercy on us and help us, Lord, to always walk as children of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Help us, God, to bring you glory in what we say and what we do. We pray and ask, God, that you would help us to shine your light to all the people that you bring in our paths, Lord. We pray and ask that you would open the doors of their hearts and prepare them for the good news and help us to have your boldness to share that good news. We love you, God. We praise you. We thank you for your word today. We ask that you open our understanding to glean all that you have for us today, God, and that we would be changed by it. Thank you, Lord, for being here. Thank you for this wonderful Holy Spirit you have given us in these jars of clay. We love you, we praise you, we worship you, we magnify you now in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 Love one another. Thank you. How are you doing? Good. I'm here. You got an extra Thank you. Thank you.
Good morning, Calvary Chapel. Just talking to Bob about food. I think maybe we're due for another potluck or something soon. Yes. We'll have a potluck every Sunday that Joe and Dottie are gone. <laughs> that wouldn't be fair, would it? No, actually, yeah, Joe and Dottie are getting ready to go on vacation. They're going to enjoy some time together on a cruise. Um, so we're going to be missing them the next couple Sundays. But... You know, it's a great time of refreshing for them. Uh, let's all stand up. We're going to be reading out of Psalm 82 today. And this is a plea for justice, a song of Psalm of Asap. Uh, unless I hit the wrong key and then we're not doing that one. Uh, here we go. God, stand in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Wow. You know, sometimes we forget. We look forward to the, the rapture, the, the taking of the church, uh, and, you know, Jesus' second coming. But man, he's also coming to judge the earth. And it should put a real burden in us to reach out to the lost and dying. Because there's a lot of them. You know them, I know them. 
Let's pray. Lord, just for those people who don't know you in this world, I ask that you just touch their hearts, give them the desire to be fulfilled, to, to know what it is they're missing in their life, to know, know that there is judgment coming and they need a Savior. And the only one who can save is the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice for us on the cross so that we could be cleansed of our sins out of nothing we have done but everything you did. We praise you for your, your glory and might and majesty, your grace and peace and forgiveness. Lord, we're so undeserving. And we just love you with all our hearts. Lord, just as Pastor Joe comes up here, just fill him with your Holy Spirit as he gives your word to us. And Lord, just open our hearts and minds to what your spirit has to say to us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God is good all the time. All right. Uh, before we get started, I would like to have, I, was, I have notes up here. I don't know that I could do them justice, though. So, Josh, would you... Just stand where you're at and let us know what you guys got going over at the Rich Richmond Rescue Mission. Um, okay, so pretty much every year at the Rescue Mission where I work, which is in Richmond, if you didn't know, but I work, at the, I, I work maintenance at the Bay Area Rescue Mission. And every year around fall time, after we've done our, let's say, backpack giveaways, getting back to school events and things like that, ultimately what we're trying to do is aim at trying to prepare for both the fall time and the colder uh, winter months where people are going to rely more heavily on our shelter and on our warehouse to give out donations for not only community dinners, for, pe for dinners for people in the shelter, but also people who are in the larger neighborhood who can come forward to our warehouse and get groceries for free. And so ultimately what we're doing is trying to have what, you know, a basic canned food drive so that we can have enough to give out without running out before Thanksgiving happens. Because Thanksgiving is the next big giveaway where we're going to have like lump sums of groceries to, to give to uh, neighborhood and, and homeless community and everyone else. And so ultimately, they're trying to partner with churches like ours to try to, uh, you know, expand their reach so that people who can't go all the way to Richmond to drop off uh, a, a bag of cans or whatever are going to come to Sunday church. If you'd like to drop them off here, my wife and I actually are, are able to <coughs> transport them back there. So if you guys would like to partner with the organization that I work for, we're trying to gather together as many unperishable food items, mostly canned, canned goods and things like that, to help uh, sustain the need for fall and winter. So how many collection days are you going to have to tow in? Um, that's a good question. I don't know, but it's a, it's a good ways off. To be honest with you, there's no okay. way like a collection cutoff thing. Okay. They're always doing it. Uh, but for right now, we're, we're, we're having an increase in... in Focus need. on that one, right. Um, and because of the increase in need, they're having an increase in, in asking. So... That's ultimately what it is. It's not necessarily a timeline thing. It's more of a, the need is increasing all the way until January. Okay. So you can just bring him in here and we'll put up a table out in the front. Uh, main thing also is just make sure that they're in date and code so that we don't give people bad food. Amen. <laughs> Spiritually or materially. <laughs> Let's open your Bibles to John chapter 7. And we'll be looking at just three verses this morning, verse 37, 38, and 39, but it is a uh, chock-full text for us this morning. We are with Jesus in the seventh month of the year on the Jewish calendar. And sometimes around probably October, November or so, the seventh month was typically a busy one for Israel. And it started with the Feast of Trumpets and then the Day of Atonement. And then in the middle of the month was the celebration that lasted a week. And that was the Feast of the Tabernacles or Sukkot. And we saw how Jesus' brothers wanted him to go to Jerusalem with them 
thinking that they could come in and, and make a big splash to get a lot of attention. However, we found that Jesus preferred to follow his brothers quietly. And he didn't want to raise a lot of attention. He didn't want people to uh, pay attention to him even really, at least, at least for the first part of the week that he was up there. There had been a lot of questions that people had about Jesus. And he has stirred up quite a bit of controversy as people began to believe in him as the Messiah. Now, as you read ahead a little bit in those verses, you see what it's referring to. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at it from purely the cultural or the current time in terms of what it meant and what we, they were talking about. And then later in the study this morning, we'll, we'll look at the application for our lives and how this applies to us. And so we pick up here at the end of, of the Feast of Tabernacle. In verse 37, we'll just read through it together. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now to understand this, you need to understand a little bit more about the Feast of Tabernacles. It was intended to do and celebrate really a couple of things. Number one, to remember the 40 years in the wilderness. It was to remind the people of how the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, living in tents or tabernacles or Sukkot. And to celebrate this, the people would set up these booths and they made these booths of, of branches and you know they would live outside with their family. They would create them or construct them in certain ways that you could still look through and just gaze upon the stars as you lay in your bed. And it was kind of like a, a camping out, a family camp, if you would. Secondly, though, it was not only to celebrate the years in the wilderness, it was to celebrate the harvest. For the farmers were... In the growing season, it was now over. The crops have been all harvested. And the farmers at this point had a chance to rest. The requirements of the feast and the Mosaic law had to do with sacrifices. And so on the first day of the feast, Numbers chapter 29, verse 13 tells us, You shall present a burnt offering, an offering made by fire as a sweet aroma to the Lord. 13 young bulls, 2 rams, and 14 lambs in the first year. And they shall be without blemish. These animal sacrifices were accompanied with grain offering and a drink offering. Wine was also poured out. There would then be sacrifices every day for 7 days. The only difference was that each day there would be one less bull offered as a burnt offering. If you added it up and totaled it up, there would be a total of 70 bulls sacrificed over a period of seven days. That's a lot of bull. And according to Jewish tradition, they saw this as a bull being sacrificed for every nation in the world at that time. The first seven days of the feast were to symbolize those 40 years in the wilderness. But as you know, there was a day coming when they actually would make it into the promised land. And apparently that's what the eighth day represented in the sequence. When they left the wilderness and they entered into the land, the land of promise. On the eighth day, there was only one bull sacrificed. And to the Jews, this was the bull sacrificed for them. That is, the nation of Israel. The other nation had received them through the seven days, but this one 
was reserved for the nation of Israel. And so here they are, symbolizing that 40 years in the wilderness. But there's a day coming that they'll make it into that promised land. And the eighth day being different, in fact, the Jews considered it a separate feast. Now, there is a little bit of disagreement upon and among scholars as to which day Jesus stood up during this time and said what he said in our text. But it seems to me that the best understanding was that it wasn't on the eighth day, but on the seventh day. Through time, there were a couple of more additions to Sokot. On the evening of the first night, the golden candlestick was lit in the court of women at the temple. And this was as a picture of the pillar of fire by night that led Israel in the wilderness during that time. Now, before Jesus' time, a ceremony was added to Sukkot, Sukkot that had to do with water. And some have suggested that the people in the city were getting a little bit anxious about their water supplies in the fall. This added ceremony was seen partly as a cry to God for rain, that they would not run out of water. And so every day of Sokot, at daybreak, the priests would lead this procession of people from the temple and they would go all the way up to the pool of Siloam. The choir then would sing a song from Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And at the pool of Siloam, the priest would fill a golden pitcher with water. The pitcher held about two and a half pints of water. He would then lead the procession back over to the temple. And when he arrived at the temple, there would be three blasts from a chauffeur. Not the ones that drive the cars, but the shofar. And the water would be taken to the west side of the altar where it would be poured out. And this was accomplished with songs, shouts, triumphs, trumpets. Just a time filled with joy. And the people would shout and they would sing from the book of Psalms. Psalm 118 verse 1. Oh yes, give thanks to the Lord for He is good and His mercy endures forever. In Psalm 118 verse 25. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. And they would then shake their myrtle, willow, and palm branches toward the altar as if to remind God of His promises. On the seventh day, the priests would circle the altar seven times before they would pour out the water. Similar to the Israelites walking around Jericho those seven times. And, those, and then on the sixth time around the altar, the priests with the water were joined by the priests with wine and it was poured out. After that seventh trip around the altar, the priests would hold then up the water and the people would shout for him to raise it higher, higher, higher. And he's on his tippy toes, getting it as high as he could. And the people would beat their tree branches until the leaves fell off. I mean, they would just go crazy with praise songs. It was a holy hallelujah, if you would. It was a time of great joy and celebration. And it was said that whoever had not witnessed it had never really seen rejoicing at all. This seventh day was known to the Jews as the day of great Hosanna. And so after the praises, there would be, or there would have been a, a brief pause as the priests prepared to offer the sacrifices for that day. It had been suggested that that was the point. During this pause, that Jesus stands up to make his proclamation. It is thought that the water ceremony represented three things. First, it represented the water 
that was provided for them in the wilderness. You remember the story. When the people in the wilderness first ran out of water, God showed to Moses a rock and he told Moses, strike it and the water would come out. Exodus chapter 17, verse 6. Later, at the end of the 40 years, they faced a similar situation. But this time, God's instructions were different to Moses. In Numbers chapter 20, verse 8, it's recorded, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. But you see, Moses at this particular time was a little bit upset with the people. Instead of speaking to the rock, Moses expressed that anger by once again striking the rock. Numbers 20, verse 11. After this happened, God took Moses to the side and told him that he had blown it. And as a result, after this, this, this action that Moses had taken, Moses was not going to go into the promised land. Why was Moses punished for simply striking the rock? Well, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and in verse 4, <clears throat> for they drank of the spiritual, that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. God was trying to paint a picture for them. And Moses had ruined it. The rock was the picture of Christ. Christ was struck once. For our sins. And just as Moses struck the rock. For the first time. Now we no longer need to strike the rock. To receive. At all. We simply need to speak to it. To believe in Christ. It also represented a cry for rain. Rain in Israel comes during two seasons of the year. The former rain in September through October. And the latter rain, March through April. And then thirdly, it represented the Messiah and the Holy Spirit. And you begin to see the type and how the type is applied. But in terms of the Messiah and this Holy Spirit, even the Jews had this sense that it was bigger than just water. There was more on the table than just water. They saw it as a connection to salvation. They saw it connected to the Holy Spirit. You remember the song they sang as they went to get the water in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. Therefore, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Listen to what one of the rabbis taught, Joshua ben Levi, our Levi. Why is its name called the place of drawing water? Because from thence they draw the Holy Ghost. As it is said, and ye shall draw water with joy out of the wells of salvation. I was a rabbi. And the Jewish people had that understanding a lot of them as well. Verse 38 states, as the scripture has said, we're not sure Jesus is pointing to a specific scripture, but instead, perhaps a whole bunch of scriptures that speak of this. Like Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3, for I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing upon your offspring. Verse 38 also introduces the phrase, living water to us. And to understand this, there were two types of water in Jesus' day. There were what were referred to as cisterns. There was water that was collected in underground reservoirs. And these reservoirs were referred to as cisterns. Some parts of Israel are like a desert. The only way to survive was to build a large cistern and channel the water into them during the rare rainstorms that they had. Now in Jerusalem, there's only one spring, the Gihon, which Hezekiah had channeled through solid rock to the pool of Siloam that it might dump into that pool. 
The rest of the water for the city came from that water that was collected during rainstorms and stored in these large cisterns. Some of them call it, like I said, carved out of solid rock. And so you had that of cisterns in the storage system. But you also had living water, which we already mentioned one, the, the pool of Siloam and the spring that came forth to fill it. But technically living water is flowing water. It's clean water. It's water that bubbles out of the ground. The one spring in Jerusalem flowed, like I said, into that pool of Siloam. And this is where the water came from that was being poured out on the altar during the feast. And then verse 38 refers to rivers of living water. What God wants to do is He wants to satisfy your thirst. And that's the whole setup that we're looking at. That your thirst would be satisfied. First of all, that you would have a hunger and a thirst for the things of God. That that would be a strong hunger and thirst. That it would drive you to the Word of God. That it would drive you to that quiet place, quiet time with a quiet heart. And bring you to your knees. Bring you to that place of submission. And so the Lord wants your thirst to be quenched. And the thing of it is though, not just your thirst, but the thirst of all those that are around you. Knowing that there is enough to soak everyone that you come into contact with. And so let's pivot a little bit and begin to apply this. On the great day, that is the last day of the feast, the, pe- the priests provided for us just a powerful picture of Israel's longing for her Messiah. You see, whereas in the previous seven days, the priests had drawn the water from the pool of Siloam and poured it out into the temple in the courtyard as an illustration of God's provision for the thirst that was in their bodies. On the last day of the feast, the priest returned from the pool of Siloam with empty pitchers. And it was an illustration of their need for one to satisfy that thirst that was within their heart. And so it was at the very moment when the priest held the empty pitchers in their hands. It, it just, you could kind of imagine in the temple, in the different rooms, in the place where Jesus was speaking to a large crowd. And these empty vessels are brought down, these pitchers, as an illustration of their need for that one to satisfy. It was then, most believe, at that very moment, when the priest held the empty pitchers in their hand, that Jesus cried out, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. And certainly the crowd must have wondered about this itinerant rabbi, this carpenter from Galilee, who had the audacity to cry out in the midst of the congregation. Yet no one called the ushers or the deacons in to escort him out because there was something about him that rang true. Perhaps it was his eyes. Maybe it was something in his voice that caused people to listen when he spoke. But it, you could imagine if somebody got up, Bob, maybe Bob would stood up, hey, if any man thirst, I know I'd say, where's, where's Cody? <laughs> Brian and Cody, go take Bob out of here. And I could see Bob going, but that wasn't done, it wasn't happened. Nobody was called to escort him out. But this man, there was something different about him. And his voice caused the people to listen to what he said. And it brings us to that point of understanding what living in the living water is really all about. And so here we are, again, the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Within six months, Jesus would be pinned to the cross as payment for our sin and our rebellion. If I were Jesus, I think my tendency would have been to say, you know what? I'm about to be betrayed, tortured, slaughtered as I personally take upon myself the wrath that should 
be vented upon a sinful world. So for this reason, I'm going to withdraw from the people until that time. But you know what? That's not what Jesus did. Instead of holding up in isolation, Jesus heads over to Jerusalem for an important convocation. And there, standing in the midst, really, of a huge congregation, he gives a great invitation, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. One of the three major festivals this was, each year, the Feast of Tabernacles was the happiest and most joyful. Because you camped out in these little lean-tos, similar to pup tents, and parents would you know, tell their children how God miraculously provided for their fathers for 40 years in the wilderness. They would talk about the pillar of fire by night. They would talk about the cloud by day. They'd talk about the bread that came out of the sky and the water that came forth from the rock. And to commemorate the miraculous provision of water, this procession of priests would draw water from the pool of Siloam pour it out on the floor of the temple of the courtyard during each day of the feast. However, as we said, on that eighth day, the last day, the great day of the feast, the priest would return to the pool of Siloam. They would return from it with empty vessels, signifying that when the Israelites entered the promised land, water from the rock was no longer needed. It's not needed anymore. The Feast of Tabernacles was not only commemorating the past, but it also anticipated the future. And as the priest symbolically poured out the empty vessels on the last day, the high priest would read again Isaiah 44, verse 3, For I will pour out water upon them that are thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offering. The picture is unmistakably clear. You see, Siloam, the name of the pool for which the priest drew the water, means sent one. And just as the Messiah would be the sent one who would pour out his spirit upon a thirsty people, it was at this climatic moment of the week-long celebration that a 33-year-old carpenter from Galilee stood up and broke the silence when he cried out, as loud as I'm sure he possibly could, if any man thirst, let him come to me, and out of his innermost beings shall gust forth torments of living water. This long-awaited Messiah had come to the people of Israel, and here in their midst, he invited them to come to him, and if they had, they would receive these rivers of water. Not only water within, but flowing forth from them in order that others might be served, in order that others might be refreshed as well. It's what is called the filling of the Holy Spirit or the overflow of the Spirit, the coming upon of the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the same is true today. If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. But the question is, has the Holy Spirit come upon you? Is he overflowing from you? After Jesus died and rose from the dead, he said to his disciples, receive ye the Holy Ghost. He breathed on them and they did indeed receive the Holy Ghost within them. John chapter 20, verse 22. But the question is, were they empowered? Were they like rivers of water? No, at least not yet. They were hiding in an upper room. Yes, they were believers. They were Christians. Yes, they were born again, but they still were timid and unsure about what they should be doing, where they should be going, what should be taking place. And then 40 days later, The Spirit came upon them on the day of Pentecost. And we're told in Acts chapter 2 that 3,000 of them were saved. Listen, guys. 
There's a difference between the Spirit being in you and the Spirit coming upon you, flowing from you. People say, I received the Holy Spirit when I was saved. I say, amen. You certainly did. Just like the disciples in John chapter 20. When you opened your heart to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit took up residence within you. You have the Holy Spirit. My question is, does the Holy Spirit have you? Does He have permission to mold you and shape you into the man or the woman that God wants you to be? Does the Holy Spirit have you? Jesus said to His disciples, go wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. And then you shall receive power. And that Greek word power is dunamis. It's from the place we get our word dynamite. And so Jesus promised dynamic power to enable them to be His witnesses, to enable them to be His disciples. Same goes for you and I. He's given us that ability to receive that power that would enable us to be the believers He wants us to be, to do the things He wants us to do. It's not by might. It's not by power. But it is by my Holy Spirit that we do the things we do as unto the Lord and for the Lord. Jesus promised that dynamic power to enable them to do these things. But not only did it satisfy them, quench their thirst, it also overflowed from them. In a vision of the millennial kingdom, Ezekiel saw a river flowing from the temple in Ezekiel chapter 47. And a man said to Ezekiel, walk with me. And they walked 1,500 feet. And the man said to Ezekiel, step in. Ezekiel stepped into the river and it was up to his ankles. The man said again, walk with me. And they walked 1,500 more feet. And again, Ezekiel was instructed, step into the river. And this time the water was up to his knees. A third time they walked together. And the third time Ezekiel stepped into the river, which came up this time to his waist. Finally, after walking further, Ezekiel stepped into the river once again, but this time he could not stand. The water being over his head, Ezekiel was enveloped. He was enwrapped in the flow of the river. You that have gone rafting with us, you know what that feels like. (laughs) Especially if I get angry with you and push you in. But you know the power of the river. You know the power of that. And so he could not resist the flow. And it's a perfect illustration, really, of the life of the Spirit. That is, you get saved, and you step in, and you're up to your ankles. You're standing on the promises. You're learning how to stand on the promises of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. As you head down the road towards heaven, You go a little bit deeper in your walk and you become aware of impotence in your life, of missing parts. And so you call upon the Lord and you're up to your knees then in prayer. A little further on in your pilgrimage, you want to see others saved. And so you start witnessing, you start ministering, you start serving the Lord and you realize all of a sudden now, you're up to your weight. And this is for the waist. But those, this is for those of you that have come and said, well, how do I serve? How do I get involved? Where do I start? This is the progression that you start with. One way of explaining it. You, little by little, from the ankles to the knees, from the knees to the waist. And then you get to that place where you finally say, I just want to be over my head in you, Lord. I want to be sold out for you, Lord. I want to be given completely and wholly unto you. I no longer want to be in control of my ministry or of my destiny. Lord, take me. Immerse me in your spirit. Sweep me off my feet. Baptize me in your power. 
Do with me as you wish. You come to that point, guys, where you're completely under the water, completely under the control of the Spirit of God. That is being filled with the Spirit. You say, well, great, Joe, that sounds fantastic, but how does that happen practically? How can I live in the Spirit? How can I be like Ezekiel, over my head, immersed in His power, empowered by Him? And to that, I would suggest three steps for your consideration. Step number one, come to the rock. You guys realize that you're as close to God as you want to be, as close to God as you choose to be. For the scripture tells us in James, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It begins with you. It begins with you taking that step, stepping out by faith. And allowing God is just as we just described. Stepping in ankle deep. What is that? Maybe it's teaching a Sunday school course. A class. Maybe it's just being an usher. Who knows what that means to you. Maybe it's going to be something entirely different than God wants to do in you and wants to do through you and allow it to flow from you. But you need to spend that time with him in the water. You need to take the first step. You need to draw near to him. How do you draw near to him? Guys, prayer, fellowship, reading the word. You know, these are things that you need to do on a consistent basis. Not because they're works, but because you love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and you're looking for ways in which to get closer and closer and closer to him. And so come to the rock. Moses, we saw, struck the rock, Exodus 17. And it poured out water for a thirsty people. Paul, as we already mentioned in 1 Corinthians 10.4, tells us that Christ was the rock, or the rock was Christ. And you see, when Jesus Christ, the rock of our salvation, when he was smitten on the cross, blood and water flowed from his side. John 19, verse 34. And while blood speaks of the cleansing of sin, the water speaks of the Spirit of God. But the thing that we need to understand is that the blood must be shed before the Spirit can flow. 1 John chapter 5, verse 6. The blood must be shed before the Spirit can flow. Therefore, because the Holy Spirit cannot dwell in you or come upon you until your sin is dealt with, the first step is being filled to being filled with the Spirit is to simply get saved to come to Christ, to come to the rock. And like the woman at the well, you'll find your thirst quenched forever. And so number one, come to the rock. Uh, rock. Number two, speak to the rock. Again, in Numbers chapter 20, the Israelites were thirsty once again. And Moses cried to the Lord, and the Lord said, speak to the rock and it shall give forth water. But Moses, weary of whining and murmuring and, and the complaining of his congregation of three million. He looked and he said, you rebels, we fetch, must we fetch you water again? And out of anger, he struck the rock twice. And although the water came out graciously, Moses was punished for his misrepresentation of God to the people. And so God said to Moses, I'm not mad at my people, Moses. I'm not disappointed in them. And I'm not through with them. Therefore, because you called them rebels and because you smote the rock when I told you to speak to it, you'll not enter into the promised land. Listen carefully, guys, because the rock of ages, Jesus Christ, was smitten when he died for our sins. When you are thirsty, when you're aware that you need empowering, you don't need to work something up emotionally or expend a lot of energy physically. You don't need to lash out in frustration as Moses did. All you need to do is speak to the rock. You say, Lord, I'm thirsty. Say, my life is not flowing. Nothing's happening the way that I intended for it to happen. Lord, have mercy upon me. Why were you sitting Lord, have mercy upon me. Because I've missed the, the, 
the bus. And I'm not where you want me to be. So Lord, have your way. Jesus said regarding this, Luke 11, verse 13, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? He's not going to play games with you. He's not going to withhold that from you. If you ask, he'll give it. Why do you think we have to position ourselves in a certain way physically? Or why would you think you need to shout emotionally or dance heatedly in order to receive the water of the Spirit when all we need to do is to speak to the rock? You don't need to beat the rock. Speak to the rock. And then finally, come to speak but also sing to the rock. Sing to the rock. Come to the rock, speak to the rock, sing to the rock. Numbers 21. The Israelites thirsted once again. This time, however, they simply sang a song, verses 17 and 18. And the water sprang forth from the well that they dug. You see, the rock didn't actually literally, physically follow them in the wilderness wanderings. Rather, most commentators agree that a subterranean river flowed from the rock, providing a perpetual flow of water under their feet. Consequently, all the Israelites had to do was to, in order to be refreshed at any given moment was to realize that even if they couldn't see it, the current was moving below them. And all they had to do was to sing out in faith. And water would bubble to the surface. So too, if you are saved this morning, the Spirit is in you and the Spirit is with you wherever you go. But He will come upon you and He will overflow you from from you life, from your life, if you will simply sing out in faith. Be filled with the Spirit, Paul said, speaking to yourself in hymns, psalms, hymns, Spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Be ye being filled with the Spirit of God. Continually being filled. In the book of Ephesians, that's right near where Paul goes on to say, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Why do we gather on Sunday mornings? Because I'll tell you, something happens when people come together to sing praise and to speak to each other in hymns, psalms, and spiritual songs. Something happens at the Lord's table when we realize the rock has already been smitten. Something happens in the place of prayer when we simply talk to the rock. Something happens when we begin to sing. Something begins to bubble up. Something begins to overflow. So how do you get filled with the Holy Ghost? How do you experience the coming upon of the Holy Spirit? It's not by incantations. It's not by gyrations. It's not by manipulation. It's simply by coming to the rock given to us. Speaking to the rock smitten for us. And singing to the rock that's present within us. Come to the rock. Speak to the rock. Sing out believing that the rock has already provided a flow underneath the surface. It is there presently. So sing out expectantly. Sing out expecting, anticipating what God will do in your life, in your, in your walk, in your witnessing, in your serving, in your ministry, in whatever it is that he will, you'll find yourself doing. Apply these principles to that gifting that he's given you or that calling that he's placed upon your life. Sing out, believing that the rock has already provided the flow underneath the surface and he's just waiting. It's there presently. Sing expectantly and receive it by faith today. 
And may the Lord cause you to be over your head in him, out of control in the flow of the Spirit of God. Not out of control like doing cartwheels down the middle of the aisle. I'm going to have to call Cody again. (laughs) Cody's bigger than I am. But not to do those things that are crazy. Do those things that glorify your Father which is in heaven. Bring refreshment and joy and the power of the Holy Spirit. And then just to wrap up this morning, in verse 39, John gives us a little commentary on what Jesus had just said. That the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Before the Holy Spirit would come upon the believers, Jesus would first have to pay for their sins by dying on the cross and rising them from the, raising them from the dead. Or him rising from the dead. That's how he would pay the price and the penalty of sin. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. The spirit-filled life, and within the spirit-filled life, the first thing you need to determine is, are you thirsty? Are you unsatisfied with your Do you like where you're at right now? Or do you want more? That's what you have to figure out. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never opened your life to Christ. Maybe you realize that you need help. Maybe you are a believer, but you've been living your life in your own strength. Four things I want you to glean from this passage and then we're done. Number one, thirst. We've talked about it already. You have to have a need for him. You have to suffer from thirst. Suffer from thirst. There must be a strong sense of need in our life. We truly need to come to the point where we realize just how much we need God's help. If we're not complacent about it, and we don't really care one way or the other, then don't expect anything to happen. Remember, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Thirst, hunger. Number two, come to Jesus. We talked about that. You have to realize that in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to come to Jesus. Going to Mahabhan won't do. Going to Buddha won't work. Going to a special pastor to pray over you is a nice sentiment, but if you really want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, where do you got to go? To Jesus. If you aren't coming to Jesus to have your thirst met, it's kind of like that Nestle commercial gone astray. Instead of people falling backwards and hitting the swimming pool, they fall back and hit nothing but dust. Only Christ has paid the price for your sin, enabling you to come into a personal relationship with God. Number three, drink. Drink. It's not just being thirsty. You got to drink. And in order to drink, what do you got to have? An open mouth. It's easy. Imagine drinking a glass of water with your mouth closed. You would certainly have a drinking problem. To receive the Holy Spirit, you have to open what? Your heart. A.B. Simpson used this illustration about being filled with the Spirit. Quote, being filled, with this full, being filled with the fullness of God is like a bottle in the ocean. You take the cork out of the bottle and sink it in the ocean. And you have the bottle completely full of ocean. The bottle is in the ocean and the ocean is in the bottle. The ocean contains the bottle, but the bottle contains only a little bit of the ocean. So it is with the believer. A.W. Tozer wrote, We're filled into the fullness of God, but of course we cannot contain all of God because God contains us. But we can have all of God that we can contain.
contain. If we only knew it, we could enlarge our vessel. The vessel gets bigger as we go on with God. We go on with God as we go from the ankles, the knees, to the waist, to the head. It's in submission and surrender to God. Number four, believe. Jesus didn't say, he who feels this tingle way down his back will have the rivers of living water. It's not what he said. He said, he who, what? Believes. Being filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is based on trust and faith, not on feelings. Submit yourself to the will of God. If you are a believer, there's no time like today to simply say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Rule over my life. Enable me. Encourage me to be that believer, that Christian that is approved of you. Amen. Amen. Father, we just love you this morning. And Lord, there's a lot of information that's been given. And I just pray that, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, maybe we, we, we get it, we can come. I can do that. I can set aside some time and as we said, quiet heart, quiet place, quiet time. And just look to you, surrender to you, yield to you, hunger and thirst for you. And Lord, I pray that you would just respond to that drawing near to you. And it doesn't say you can only do that while you're in church. You can do that anytime, anywhere, for however long you want. The Lord never grows tired of that. And Lord, we just pray that as we come, that we thirst, that we, Lord, would open our mouths and receive that, Lord, we would be empowered by your Holy Spirit in such a way that, Lord, the times of witnessing, of serving, of ministering that we become a part of, we'd never get burned out because we're not trying to do it in and of our own strength and power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Teach us, Lord, how to just walk in your Holy Spirit, fully submerged, fully engaged. And may we just be blessed immensely as we see the result of your Holy Spirit flowing forth from us by not only touching the way that we do things, the way that we walk, the way that we minister, the way that we serve, the attitudes that we have, the way we do battle against the issues that we battle against. That, Lord, you would just keep us in the palm of your hand and use us mightily for your kingdom that you might be glorified. We love you, Lord. We praise you. And we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord. Ushers, if you could come at this time.
Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that we could see it all made? All creation groaning, it is. There's a new creation coming, it is. There's a glory of the Lord to wait, the light within our midst, it is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slain. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. Does Jesus our Messiah forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again?
God so worthy. Lord, I thank you for your word spoken to us today. Lord, just help us to dive into your spirit. Not just the miracles, not the meal, but over our lives. Lord, you say if you ask, you'll get with me. And we're asking you for today. Lord, use us. Fill us with your spirit. Use us today. Use us throughout the week. Use us for our entire lives. Let us be found faithful and true, serving you and your gospel. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. God go with you. This is it for today, this morning anyways. Meet somebody that you don't know. Say hi to them and love them in the Lord. Amen. God bless you guys.